finally, finally, this video is here. <laughs> So you've heard me say time and time again that a good brush is not a substitute for good painting skills. With that said, however, a good set of brushes can in fact make the experience of painting a lot more enjoyable and a lot more efficient. Today's video was requested four separate times, so a massive thank you to Grace O, Patricia James, Alastelia Art, and the entire middle row of my keyboard for requesting this video. <laughs> Now, this video was a bit of a challenge to um, structure because where do you even begin when it comes to brushes? But thankfully, I've been able to break it down into two parts with three subparts each. In part one, we'll look at the three main types of brushes that, in my opinion, are pretty much all you need to paint pretty much anything under the sun. And in part two, we'll look at what makes a good brush, what I look for in a good brush, and also a super quick and easy tip on how to make any brush dynamic. Now bear in mind, I use Adobe Photoshop, but these tips do apply to brushes in pretty much any painting software out there. Plus, I have a massive list of resources down in the description below. We'll dive into it a little more as we go through the video. As always, if you enjoyed this video, then please remember to give me a big thumbs up. Hit that subscribe button down below because the next video may or may not be a big style study. I'm just going to put that out there. But for now, let's dive into some brushes. Like I mentioned in the intro, high quality brushes are not a substitute for high quality painting. To really demonstrate this, here's a clip of me painting the same sphere twice. The first one is painted with very high quality textured brushes, but this is how I used to paint, say, two years ago, when I was sure that I could make up for poor painting skills by just using the right brushes. The second sphere is painted using only a hard round pressure opacity brush, which I also call my magic brush. If you watch me paint a lot and you watch the skin painting tutorial that I put up a few months ago, you know that this simple brush is my holy grail. It's just a basic round brush with opacity and flow control set to pressure, as in the harder I press down on the tablet, the more opaque the colour, kind of like when you paint with a crayon. As you can tell, the second sphere, where I literally just used one very simple brush, looks a lot more dimensional and believable, whereas the first one, where I used a whole bunch of textured brush strokes, kind of looks like a mess. I hope this exercise really imprints into your mind the importance of how you use the brushes as opposed to what brushes you use. With that said, however, there are three main brush types that I always reach for. In Photoshop, these are called your brush presets, and any brushes you download will be packed together as an ABR file. You'll notice that I always have the brush preset window open when I paint, because it is essentially a toolbox that I flip through all the time. Some artists prefer to basically conjure the preset window using a right click, but I crave stability, so I like for it to be in one place at all times. So anyway, here are the three main types of brushes that you should have in your toolkit. These might seem trivial, but I personally think that your basic brushes are the most important ones and you should choose them very carefully. I always recommend having a good pencil brush. The one I use is so old I don't even know where it's from, however it is easily duped and I've linked a google doc below to free brush packs that have pretty much identical brushes to the ones I use. I use the pencil brush to sketch out my initial drawings because it imitates the feeling of traditional sketching and just helps me think better. The next important brushes are the pressure size brushes. These make for the best line art brushes because it's like actually drawing with a brush pen. The harder you press, the thicker the line gets. I have a pressure size hard brush as well as a similar soft brush, both of which came in Aaron Griffin's free brush pack, again, linked it in the Google Doc. 
I use the hard brush for any line art and to block in the initial silhouette, while the soft airbrush is excellent for smoothing things out or adding light effects through color dodge. The next important brush is the magic brush that I mentioned earlier. It's a very simple hard edged round brush and I've got the opacity and flow set to pen pressure. The reason I love this brush is that it is so versatile. If I want to create large translucent washes of colour, I just up the size and colour in lightly. If I want tiny details, I lower the size and press down harder on the tablet. If I want a soft blend, I grab the local colours using a colour picker and then use varying pressure to blend it all out. And I love that it has a hard edge because it makes sure that nothing looks too soft or overly blended. Another important brush is your chalk type of brush. Fizz Shop comes with a bunch of cool ones preloaded, but I personally swear by Dave Greco's DG Main Brush. Granted, this one is part of a paid pack, but it is a diamond brush with opacity and flow set to pressure control, and it has a speckled overlay. Chalk brushes are beautifully responsive, and they are excellent for adding those strong pops of highlight or blocking in some hard shadows. So those are the basic brushes you want to have. A pencil brush, a pressure sized hard brush for line art, a pressure sized soft brush for your airbrushing needs, a pressure opacity hard brush for the painterly rendering, and a chalk brush for your harder, more opaque rendering. Honestly, you could legit just have this basic brush set and paint pretty much anything under the sun. However, I know you guys are a little more ambitious than that, so here are two other brush types that will make life so much easier. Now, a lot of people might consider this cheating, but honestly, silhouette brushes make painting so much more efficient. These are basically stamps that create complex silhouettes for you, so you don't have to spend ages drawing all the little shapes and then rendering them in. Personally, I use these a lot for quickly throwing in architecture, mountains, trees, birds, gemstones and so on. Obviously, when you use silhouette or stamp brushes, it is important to apply some discretion. Always remember to align the stamps to your perspective and keep in mind the lighting setup. I usually put silhouettes in a new layer, then distort them to fit the right perspective. Then I lock the transparency and paint over them with the right colours and lighting so that they actually fit into my scene. If needed, I'll layer them or erase bits off to fit in with the scene as a whole. Another super quick way to properly integrate silhouettes into a painting is to use fog or mist. It's literally as simple as grabbing a soft airbrush and a light colour and painting over the silhouette, especially close to the sky or the ground. So it almost looks like the silhouette is peeking through a foggy distance. There are loads of free silhouette brushes on the internet and I've added a bunch of my favourite ones that I use all the time to the Google Doc as well. Again, link is in the description. Alright, these are my shining golden boys. Scatter brushes are the key to finishing any digital painting, at least in my opinion. As the name suggests, scatter brushes create a random smattering of shapes that helps add all the important details that your painting needs. One great example of scatter brushes is the cloud brush. Sure, you could paint clouds using a soft airbrush and then add in the hard edges and shadows, or you could take the much more efficient way out and start with some scattered cloud brushes. Again, the Aaron Griffin brush pack has some cool cloud brushes, as do some of the other packs I've linked in that doc. When it comes to painting faces, scatter brushes are super important because that's how you add your pores and freckles to the skin, as well as any glitter if you're so inclined. I know Pixel Stains have some amazing skin texture brushes, I highly recommend playing around with pores. In environment paintings, and this is my most abused trick, scatter brushes will quickly add stars and dust and floating specks. 
Honestly, the reason I add these is twofold. One, obviously, it is to push the realism, but smaller specks of light and dust actually help balance out the composition. We spend so much time rendering the bigger elements that we can often forget to balance those out with smaller, unstructured elements. Scatter particle brushes take care of that compositional balance so everything looks well-rounded. With that said, however, the one issue with scatter brushes is that they can often come off looking very stampy. So for instance, these star brushes that I've downloaded, when I drag them around, they are essentially the same shape stamped over and over again, and that obviously looks absolutely awful. So in part two, I'm gonna show you guys a super easy way to make any brush, specifically any scatter brush, more dynamic. But that's pretty much it for part one. So as a quick recap, here are the three main brush types you need in your arsenal. Number one, the basic brushes. I highly recommend having these five basic brush types, a pencil brush for sketching, a hard pressure size brush for inking and line art, as well as color blocking, a soft pressure size airbrush for smoothing things out and adding softer light effects, a hard pressure opacity brush for all the shading and painterly rendering, and a final chalk brush to block in those hard shapes. Number two, silhouette brushes help quickly concept out environments and background details, but make sure to adjust the silhouettes and paint over them so they fit your perspective and lighting setup. And number three, scatter brushes. They help to add the smaller random shapes, such as clouds and stars, but use these with some discretion so they balance out the composition without completely losing the larger shapes. Okay, so it's all well and good having a cool texture brush, but like we saw with the starry brushes, it just doesn't go well if the brush isn't dynamic. The whole point of having all these digital brush presets is for it to mimic traditional brush strokes and for it to be responsive. You want to feel like you're actually painting, not just copy pasting a shape into a document, right? So whether you want to customize downloaded brushes or make your own from scratch, here are three important attributes that will make your brushes dynamic. We've seen this a couple of times already, but the easiest customization for any brush is to set the opacity and flow jitter to pen pressure. I like to think of this as using a crayon or a color pencil. When you scribble lightly, it creates a very soft, very see-through layer. But if you press down really hard with a crayon, it puts down a thick layer of opaque color. Similarly, when you set opacity and flow to pen pressure, it maps the opacity of the brush to how much pressure you put down on the tablet. In Photoshop, you can make this adjustment in the brush settings window. Pick any brush, go to brush settings and look for the transfer submenu. Here you'll see opacity jitter and flow jitter. Leave the sliders alone, but set both the drop down menus to pen pressure. I also like to set a minimum value just so that it's not completely transparent when I apply very little pressure. You can totally set it to zero, but this is just my personal preference. So remember, setting opacity and flow to pen pressure is like coloring with a crayon. Now this one is for you lot who do a lot of line art. This is where you set your pen pressure to control the size of the brush. So I like to think of this as using a brush ink pen like traditional manga line artists do. So if you have the pen barely touching the paper, you'll get a very thin line, but if you press down, the line thickens up. However, the opacity is the same as in whether thin or thick, the lines are still a solid color. Another great feature in Photoshop or digital painting softwares in general is the ability to enable smoothing. It essentially adds a bit of lag to the brush, causing the lines to come out a lot smoother. 
I personally don't use it too much because, well, you guys know how much I do not use line art in my work. My brain just doesn't function in the right way for that. But I know a lot of you guys are way braver than I am, so it might be a feature that you would enjoy. But the main reason I use pressure size brushes is to block in the silhouette of my characters. So as you can see here, I have a sketch down and the first thing I do is block the silhouette in with a dark cyan. This allows me to lock the transparency so that I'm only painting within the lines, so to speak. The size control is super handy because I can easily block in the big and small edges of the silhouette without having to fiddle around with the brush radius. Essentially, I can use a single stroke to create thick and thin lines. This, you guys, is the secret weapon to turning any brush dynamic, especially scatter brushes. Remember how we looked at that star brush that looked too stampy? Well, that's because it is taking the same shape and repeating it over and over again. So to make it look dynamic, you almost want the brush to stamp different shapes as it goes along. And the easiest way to do that, especially with these scatter brushes, is to turn up the angle jitter. So in the brush settings panel, you want to go to the shape dynamics submenu this time. Here you'll see a slider bar for angle jitter. Set the value quite high and keep the control drop down set to off. What this will do is that every time the brush puts down a shape, it'll be at a different angle. The higher the jitter value on the slider, the bigger the difference in angle. So now, instead of the same shape being stamped, the brush will stamp it at different angles. So say for a cloud brush, this now causes the clouds to be painted at varying angles, giving you a much wider variety of shapes. If you really want to push the randomness, you can also set it to have a size jitter. So along with the angle of the brush, it'll also switch up the size of it randomly. This tends to be a bit too much for my inner control freak, so I generally keep the size jitter fairly low, often zero. And another little tweak you can make, particularly with speckled brushes such as glitter, pour or star brushes, is to play with the spacing. This is the distance between two brush stamps. With, say, stars, if the stars are stamped too close together, it look very weird and unnatural. So you want to go to the brush settings panel and go to the first submenu, which is your brush tip shape. Here you can play with a spacing slider at the bottom and the brush preview will show you how far apart the brush strokes will be placed. Play around with it until it looks most natural and believable. And always remember to save your settings. Now the easiest way to do this is to lock the submenus that you've played with. But if you want to keep the new settings without losing the original brush, you can always hit the little icon that looks like a little plus in a box, which will save these settings as a brand new brush. I also find that locking the submenus isn't quite the best way to save your brush settings because it doesn't really save the shape dynamic settings, which is the first submenu without the lock on it. So it's kind of a little eh when it comes to saving your entire preset. So I always recommend using that little plus in a box to save a new preset and that will save all of the settings. Now, I'm not going to go into how to make a custom brush from scratch today because A, this video is already so long and B, there are tons of amazing tutorials on this already and C, I am generally too lazy to do this. I would much rather take a pre-made brush and alter it to fit my needs, but that's just me. But in the description below, I've linked some really helpful tutorials that help you make a brush from scratch with textures and everything. So if you're interested, check those out. With that said though, I'm also thinking of making a video about photo textures. We'll look at this in a little bit in the outro. But to recap part two, here are some quick ways to customize brushes and make them more dynamic. Number one, set the opacity and flow to pen pressure control. Essentially, it turns any brush into a crayon. So the harder you press on it, the more opaque the brush stroke. This really helps with things like blending and mixing colors and being able to create soft gradients. 
2. Setting the brush size to pen pressure control essentially turns the brush into a brush ink pen. So while the opacity is unchanged, the harder you press on the tablet, the thicker the line. This basically mimics traditional Japanese calligraphy brushes and when you combine it with line smoothing, it is the perfect recipe for clean line art. And number three, turning up the angle jitter while turning off the control settings causes the brush to put down shapes a lot more randomly. This helps make texture and scatter brushes a lot more dynamic so it doesn't look like they're repeatedly stamping down the same shape. You can also play with the size jitter to further randomize the brush dynamics. And that's pretty much everything there is to know about how I use brushes in digital painting. Like I've mentioned throughout this video, I do have a whole bunch of resources that you can check out down in the description. They're all free and I highly recommend checking them out. With that said though, I am contemplating making another video about how I use photo textures to basically cheat painting in textures on things like fabric, metal, rock, mountains, architecture and that kind of stuff. I might also include how I use custom shape selections and things like that to cheat architecture and little background details, details on rocks, you know, things like that, how to make a background look more believable without any work at all. So if that's something you're interested in, then please make sure to like the pinned comment in the comment section below. So that will be the first comment that you see right up there. Give that a thumbs up so I know you'd like to see a video on photo textures and custom shapes. As always, if you've enjoyed this video, then please remember to give me a big thumbs up, leave me a comment telling me you enjoyed it, so I know you did. Um, hit that subscribe button down below, because like I said in the intro, we do have a style study coming up next week, but don't tell anyone I told you. But yeah, with all of that said, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. I hope it's been as much fun for you as it has for me, and I'll see you guys on the next one. Bye!